breakthrough infections. Taiwan has confirmed more Omicron COVID-19 cases. Pillar of shame. One of Hong Kong's last public symbols against China's Tiananmen massacre is pulled down in a cover of darkness. Christmas treats. Taipei gets a taste of Lithuanian delights at its food fair. And it's the giving season. How children in Taiwan are receiving letters from Santa. A warm welcome to Taiwan Plus News. I'm Betty Chen. Taiwan has confirmed today that four previously reported cases of COVID-19 are the Omicron variant. That brings the total number of cases of the new strain to 16, all of them imported and from fully vaccinated people. Separately, the Central Epidemic Command Center said today there were 13 imported cases of COVID-19. As Taiwan settles into the slightly more relaxed so-called 7 plus 7 regulation for travelers entering the country, health authorities say it is working. Two COVID-19 cases from yesterday's count were detected during seven days in a quarantine hotel, just before returning home to continue their quarantine for seven more days. The new cases were all breakthrough infections, but with mild to no symptoms. Nonetheless, Taiwan is implementing new measures to try to ensure that people have the best protection that vaccinations can give them. Starting on Friday, the CECC will allow mixing and matching vaccines of second doses and booster jabs. Taiwan has purchased more Moderna and AstraZeneca doses for delivery next year and the year after to ensure ample supply. Authorities are now discussing whether to offer a fourth shot in the future. Rick Yi and Peach Zhang for Taiwan Plus. So far, Taiwan's travel measures have succeeded in keeping the Omicron variant out of the wider community. But that is not the case in at least 89 other countries that are now grappling with how to contain the spread as the holiday season approaches. Our reporter Ed Moon has the story. As measures to contain the spread of COVID-19 tighten around the globe, people living in the northern Chinese city of Xi'an are facing some of the harshest restrictions. From midnight on Thursday, some 13 million residents are under strict orders to stay home, with only one member of each household allowed to leave for essentials once every two days. The stakes are high in China, as the 2022 Winter Olympics hosted by Beijing draws closer with each passing day. But so too does the highly contagious Omicron variant make its way around the globe. Many countries are grappling with how best to contain the spread as Christmas and holiday celebrations ramp up. And there appears to be no consensus on what measures will work. Starting today, Singapore has suspended all ticket sales for quarantine-free travel until January 20th, meaning that the option to enter Singapore without serving quarantine is no longer available if you didn't already have a ticket. In Japan, the discovery of the country's first known local transmission of the Omicron variant prompted the government to extend its strict border control measures, some of the tightest in the world, with no end date in sight. The UK, on the other hand, has ruled out any new measures before Christmas on Saturday, despite reporting the highest number of daily cases since the pandemic began at over 100,000. Authorities there blame the Omicron variant for the surge, with government data showing a 59% rise in COVID cases in the last seven days. But new research is showing some hopeful signs. The risk of being hospitalized with the Omicron variant appears to be significantly lower than that of Delta, the variant that came before. A study by London's Imperial College put the risk at 40 to 50% lower, while a South African study found that patients diagnosed between October 1st and November 30th were 80% less likely to be hospitalized compared with those carrying another variant. In more positive developments, 
Medical experts in South Africa have also said that the country may have passed its peak of Omicron infections after seeing a noticeable drop in new COVID-19 cases in recent days. And to top off the good news, health authorities in the US have given emergency approval to a pill to treat COVID-19 produced by Pfizer. This would make it the first potential at-home treatment for the virus. We got good news today with the authorization of Pfizer's antiviral. Merck's pill, if authorized, along with Pfizer's newly authorized pill, add oral treatment options to our nation's medicine cabinet. As soon as emerging science showed the promise of these antivirals, we acted quickly and aggressively to pre-purchase 10 million treatment courses of Pfizer and 3 million courses of Merck. With a glimmer of hope for the future of treating COVID-19, some people are enjoying a merry December, while others prefer to stay safe with a silent night at home this Christmas. Karma Shu, Sandy Chi and Ed Moon for Taiwan Plus. A second Indigenous Advanced Jet Trainer, or AJT, has been delivered to Taiwan's Air Force. The domestically produced training aircraft is part of the country's efforts to become more self-reliant in military hardware. 66 of the Brave Eagle trainers are expected to be delivered before the end of 2026. They will replace the older AT-3 aircraft for training fighter pilots. In Hong Kong, a university has dismantled and removed a statute that commemorated China's Tiananmen Square crackdown in 1989. The Pillar of Shame was one of the few public memorials to that event remaining in the city, which is facing an ongoing crackdown on dissent. Louise Watt has the story. Wrapping up the Pillar of Shame, in the darkness of Wednesday night, workers took away the statue from a leading Hong Kong university where it had stood for more than two decades. The eight meter tall statue of torn and twisted bodies is a homage to victims of the 1989 Tiananmen Square crackdown when the Communist Party ordered the military to crush pro-democracy protests in the heart of Beijing. The topic is taboo in mainland China and since a sweeping national security law came into effect last year, public commemoration of the massacre has all but been stamped out in Hong Kong, too. Local artist Casey Wong, who went into exile in Taiwan earlier this year, condemned the removal of the pillar of shame and said it was important to have physical reminders of history. We can understand why the Chinese Communist Party uh, and their proxies in Hong Kong trying to destroy that piece of monument because they're trying to cover their crime. They have murdered innocent people. And, uh, and that pillar reminds uh, their crime uh, every year. In a statement on Thursday, the University of Hong Kong's governing body said that removing the statue was in the best interests of the university. This comes as authorities crack down on political dissent in the city. On Sunday, Hong Kong held its first legislative elections under new laws which ensure that only candidates who have shown loyalty to Beijing can run. The so-called Patriots-only election saw a voter turnout of 30%, the lowest since Britain handed Hong Kong over to China in 1997. But Beijing says such elections will better serve Hong Kong's interests. Hong Kong's leader Carrie Lam met with Chinese President Xi Jinping in Beijing on Wednesday. President Xi praised the Hong Kong government for resolutely implementing the new law. 一年来，香港由乱到治的局面不断巩固，局势不断向好发展。Hong Kong has changed markedly since the national security law was imposed. Former lawmakers and key activists are imprisoned. 
Some have been prosecuted over a Tiananmen vigil last year. Samuel Chu, the founder of a Washington, D.C.-based NGO called Campaign for Hong Kong, said the statue was originally brought over in 1997 to test Hong Kong's freedoms. So now uh, the answer, uh, the question has been answered. Hong Kong no longer has that freedom and autonomy. And that the Beijing government and the Hong Kong government now feels like they have removed enough of the civil society and the pro-democracy movement that they can simply try to wipe out history and people's memories. Beijing has long stopped public commemoration of Tiananmen in the mainland, and it appears intent on doing the same in Hong Kong. The two-ton pillar of shame has been packed away and moved out of sight. But for now at least, the statue and what it represents are still remembered. Damon Lin and Louise Watt for Taiwan Plus. President Tsai Ing-wen has given her backing to a proposal that would see the northern city and county of Xinzhou merged to become Taiwan's seventh special municipality. Under Taiwan's local government system, a special municipality is the highest level, providing access to a bigger budget and more resources. Home to the chip-making giant TSMC and numerous other champions of the country's high-tech industry, Xinzhou is vital to Taiwan's economic growth. Not everyone is on board with the idea, however, with the current Xinzhou city administered by Tsai's ruling Democratic Progressive Party, or DPP, while the more rural Xinzhou County is a stronghold of the opposition Kuomintang. Speaking during a meeting of the DPP Central Standing Committee on Wednesday, Tsai outlined her reasons for supporting the proposal. Xinzhu市是一个蛮迫切的问题 Taiwan will ban single-use styrofoam cups from next year as part of the government's efforts to cut down on waste. From July, local beverage stores will no longer be allowed to provide disposable foam cups for, for their drinks. These stores, along with fast food restaurants, convenience stores and supermarkets, must also offer a discount for customers who bring their own cups. Violators may be fined the equivalent of up to 200 U.S. dollars. This year, Lithuania has its own pavilion for the first time at a Taipei's food fair. Lithuanian producers are offering everything from chocolate, beers and snacks as they eye up the economic potential from closer ties between the two countries. James Chater has this report. <laughs> At this year's Taipei Food Fair, an inaugural appearance from Lithuania's red, yellow and green. It is the first time when Lithuania has its own booth. 23 companies, they are here gathered and two companies are representing uh, online. Lithuanian vendors are showcasing a range of sweets, snacks and beers during the three-day event at Taipei's Nangang Exhibition Hall. They are hoping to capitalize on the recent warmer relations between Taiwan and Lithuania to break into a new market. And the economic potential is great. This year, Lithuania was catapulted into Taiwan's top 10 destinations for online credit card spending after consumers flocked to the companies of its new and vocal ally. The more we stand together, the safer Taiwan, Lithuania and every single one of us is. That's a simple scheme. Local reports say that in the six months up to September, people in Taiwan bought 2.5 billion Taiwan dollars worth of Lithuanian goods. That's around 90 million US dollars. Sellers of beer and chocolate at the food fair are hoping to get in on the action. At the fair, a chance for Lithuanians to sample some Taiwanese produce too. 比较甜, 可是, 
我我觉得非常好吃。我也觉得这个是小饼干。可是里面有一点点巧克力，还有另外的味道。我觉得立陶宛小朋友会会喜欢。The Taipei Food Fair runs until Christmas Day. Taiwan hopes this is just one of many events that will signal a new era of closer ties with Lithuania. The Eastern European country has withdrawn its diplomats from Beijing, and last month officially opened a new Taiwan representative office in the capital, Vilnius. Alex Chen and James Chater for Taiwan Plus. Coming up, spreading the Christmas cheer, we meet a team helping send Santa's letters to kids in Taiwan. Details in a moment. Thanks for watching Taiwan Plus. For more great stories from here in Taiwan and around the world, please download the Taiwan Plus app. Welcome back. You're watching Taiwan Plus News. Now for a look at some international news. The former chair of Harvard University's chemistry department has been found guilty of deceiving U.S. authorities about his links to China. Charles Lieber was convicted by a Boston court of making false statements to U.S. tax authorities and failing to report a Chinese bank account. Lieber didn't declare a 50,000 US dollar monthly salary he received from a Chinese university as part of a Beijing's program to recruit highly skilled scientific talent. Lieber's conviction is the highest profile case to date in a Justice Department initiative aimed at curbing what's called Chinese economic espionage in the US. China's foreign ministry responded by saying the US should not stigmatize Chinese talent exchange programs. The death toll from Super Typhoon Rai has reached at least 375 and is expected to rise with some areas of the Philippines still inaccessible. The typhoon, known locally as Odette, hit the central Philippines last Thursday. The strongest to hit the country this year, it has affected 1.8 million people and forced at least 630,000 from their homes. Many now face a Christmas without power or internet access as rescue workers battle debris-filled and waterlogged roads to reach some areas. A landslide at a jade mine waste heap in northern Myanmar left one person dead and at least 70 others missing. Some 200 rescuers are now searching for victims who were swept into this lake in Kachin State late on Wednesday. Deadly landslides and other accidents are common in this area, which is at the center of Myanmar's jade industry. Despite a ban, poor workers from all over the country come to look for gems, mostly for export to China. A minister from Madagascar whose helicopter crashed in the Indian Ocean says he is alive and well after swimming for 12 hours before being rescued. Police Minister Serge Jale used a helicopter seat as a flotation device and removed his boots and belt to shed weight and stay afloat. His helicopter was part of a search party looking for the remains of a cargo ship that had been illegally transporting more than 100 people when it sank earlier this week. Another helicopter passenger was found alive. Two others are still missing. <laughs> Monsieur le Président, 
Tibani na nsega, mampala inafuta ni pa bithi si matenga baadhi nama kwa msota ni puda maambo nandera, sidara mapana zote wanya mlo pali lu, de telefoni kumuvir dola, de sefuta ni tiko tawe ba apari taka kili ni video ina, ba utanza na kazi kwa utanza la biasa, utanza mapala kumuvir lumo, dola sumba nsara msota la zaba. Researchers studying a fossilized egg found in southern China have discovered what they call a perfectly preserved dinosaur embryo inside it. They estimate it to be around 72 million years old. The embryo has been named Baby Yingliang and it belongs to a toothless theropod dinosaur or oviraptorosaur. Scientists from the UK and China describe the embryo as being in a tucking position with the body curled up and the head between the legs. This position, adopted right before hatching, was previously thought to be unique to birds. The skeleton proves that non-bird dinosaurs behaved in the same way. One of the most renowned authors of queer literature in Chinese, Bai Xianyong, is at the heart of a new exhibition at the National Central Library in Taipei. Shirley Lin with our partner station, Radio Taiwan International, brings you the story. At the opening of the exhibit on Bai Xianyong's writings, Taiwan's Peking opera singer Wei Haiming sang the role of Madame Qian in a Peking opera rendition of Bai's work, Wandering in the Garden, Waking from a Dream. The author is a key figure in reviving Kunqu, an old operatic tradition of China. Bai is known for introducing Western-style modernism to Chinese literature. It is the 50th anniversary of Bai's most famous work, Taipei People, a collection of 14 short stories about people fleeing to Taiwan from China during the 1950s after the Chinese Civil War. Another of Bai's well-known works is Crystal Boys, a novel about homosexual youth. It was a groundbreaking work written in the 1980s when people didn't talk openly about homosexuality in Taiwan. In the last 10 years, Bai wrote a father's trilogy about his father, Bai Chongxi, who was a famous general under Chiang Kai-shek when Chiang was leading the Chinese Nationalist Party regime in the 1950s. Bai said the relationship between his father and Chiang was a tumultuous time for 40 years. The exhibit at the National Central Library will be open till the end of December. Until five years ago, Taiwanese children could only send letters to Santa overseas. But Kathy Sun, a mother of three, changed all of that and has begun a new Christmas tradition. Our reporter, Pichi Zhang, has this heartwarming story. Eight-year-old Wang Tingyun checks the mailbox and finds a card that he's waited for all year. What he doesn't know is that this was written to him by a local group called Taiwan Santa Claus. Five years ago, Art teacher Kathy Sun told family and friends to send her their children's letters to Santa Claus, and she would reply. She received around 500 letters, but more children write in every year. This Christmas, she expects to receive more than 40,000 letters from around the world. With the help of more than 150 volunteers, Taiwan Santa Claus manages to reply to every single letter they receive. 我做这件事的理念就是希望小朋友在圣诞节的时候收到圣诞老公公的正面的希望、一个梦想的回信，可以当做他心里的种子。那当他在长大过程中遇到困难，他可以把这个种子拿出来使用，想要说一个正面的话语，可以让他往前走的动力。那我觉得这是我们最想做的事情。Soon designs all the cards the group sends out. She blends in Taiwanese elements such as Santa with a Taiwan chef beard, bubble milk tea, and leopard cat. The volunteers take time to write personalized responses to every sender. We just don't talk. Then the second, we will look at the messages. We write with Chinese messages. We write with Chinese messages. We write with Chinese messages. It's very important. Last year, they were surprised to find a letter from Taiwan President Tsai Ing-wen. We are a small group of 
Kathy and her elf team are committed to the task, not only for the children but also for themselves. 来这边看到他们写的信，觉得还蛮有趣、蛮可爱的，然后也有觉得有被疗愈到。那些来信是给你、给予你、疗愈你、正面的，帮你把你那些工作上的忧郁全部都放下，你就专心的对待这个小朋友。那你在这边做一个小时，你可以面对三十位小朋友。的珍惜，那个真诚，那是平常我们一般是感受不到的。The work of Taiwan Santa Claus has gone beyond Christmas cards. This past year, they raised funds to help buy art supplies for children in Taiwan's remote areas. 我觉得这是圣诞公公存在于每个人心中最重要的意义是带来希望。A positive sentiment that they hope will last throughout the year. As Naya Zhou and P. Xu Zhuang for Taiwan Plus. Thanks for watching Taiwan Plus News. I'm Betty Chan. We'll leave you with images from ZSL London Zoo. It's not Christmas yet, but the animals cannot wait to open their presents. For more stories from Taiwan and around the world, please download the Taiwan Plus app. Stay safe and see you next time.